Well, Dick, thank you so much for joining us on the official university podcast. We're excited to talk to you. Um, so just tell us a little bit, you grew up in Indiana, you went to high school in Indiana, but what was your first impression of Purdue? When did you first hear about it? Well, being uh, in Indiana in basketball, the path to anything regarding a, a, a college or institution was watching basketball games. So clearly my awareness of um, the word Purdue and the institution Purdue started on Channel 4 on some regional channel. Um, for Purdue basketball. And how did you decide that Purdue was the right place for you? Well, there was a couple things. I saw Purdue campus probably about 1963 or something like that. I went to, again, went to a basketball game at Lambert with a bunch of buddies and my dad and another dad took us there. So I saw the campus and then as I thought about making the decision, uh, probably around my freshman year in high school, which would have been 64, math and science were sort of distinguished in the curriculum. And I liked math and science, and um, I did fairly well in math and science. So I gave up the whole dream of going into medicine and decided that the answer was uh, engineering. And then it became an easy decision, Purdue University not near my home, within range of my home. Tell us a little bit about your time as a student at Purdue. Do you have any favorite stories or memories that really stick out? The memory goes back to the other side of things where um, I, I did work hard studying and that was kind of my value system, upbringing, achievement, and so on. So um, I was very well known in the Memorial Center, what they called the stacks. The stacks were where all the old books were that they didn't have in the library. And um, they, um, they had metal desks, they had metal chairs, and they had light bulbs in the ceiling. And it was dark, so it was very secluded. And uh, going down the engineering path, there was lots of studying to do. So I had a habit of staying until midnight and uh, the students that were at the desk in the front and reception, um, I knew them because I was usually, if not always, the, the, the last guy out, and I turned off the lights, and as I'd walk by, they'd say, you know, Dick, did you turn off the lights? So it was always at midnight. Now, my, my, my college activities weren't that bad because I just started dating and going out after midnight because midnight I was still in uh, the stacks. So that's the memory that I take away from uh, never played golf, did limited intramurals, but studied a lot. So midnight was your starting point <laughs> of the night. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was the opposite of Cinderella. <laughs> so when you look back at your classes, do you have a favorite class, maybe a favorite professor that really impacted yeah. you? Yeah, I think, I think both of those are good questions. One is the favorite classes, I would not tie it into industrial engineering. I will on the professor, but it was always fun from an intellectual level that... Um, um, they had, this, they had this mathematical equation that one out of three engineers makes it through the program, the other two don't. So physics 152 in your freshman year was where they could whack off those two guys that uh, didn't belong. And so 152 is very interesting. The good thing is it was um, graded on the curve. So uh, when you ended up with a number under 50, that still could have been good, you know. And, uh, but 152 was very intellectually stimulating. And in the engineering field, I also liked material science engineering courses, and I liked chem, chem E courses. They were very different, and, um, and that's why I think they were really engaging to me. On the professor's side, uh, he's since passed, but there was a gentleman named uh, um, Dr. Pritchker in the industrial engineering school. And he created uh, sort of a, a more of a, um, uh, he, had his own, he had his own research done around the critical path method or um, um, mythology. And critical path is just simply plotting out in business, manufacturing, or a new product, what are the steps to get to success. And it was always kind of simple locations, simple um, junctions where things got evaluated, what was the critical path. He applied. He applied um, probability to all of those. And what was interesting, he, I think he called it GASP. He had another name other than CPM. And um, it, was, it was very fascinating because what's relevant today, that was probably 1970. 
And today, in artificial intelligence, why I am involved in a couple other institutions, uh, it was almost like he created the artificial intelligence idea of plotting a critical path um, uh, back in 1970 by putting probability functions around, which is what a lot of the artificial intelligence does today. And it was very fascinating, and it was very engaging. But I, I reflect on it, it's almost, if you, if you fast forward, what, um, uh, 50 years, you know, that's 70 to today, 50 years, some of that thinking he had back then, we see today. And that's a, he was a great professor, very distinguished person, and intellectually uh, very high. And when you look back, you know, you're from a small town of 900 people. You told me earlier you, you know, mowed lawns and you, you were working really hard. And now fast forward, you've been the CEO of multiple companies, really successful career. How did Purdue help you get to where you are today? I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll go to kind of it's a catalyst, a foundation, sure. um, um, was really what Purdue did. But just to give some perspective, I, I reflected on the, 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 your numbers. It, um, you're right, the community I grew up, the town that I grew up in was Clay City, Indiana, and it was about 900 people. Now, with all the farming community, it may have been 12 or 1,500 total. Um, but I went from that to, to this day, um, my businesses took me to five different continents and 44 different countries. So it was a little different than where I started, but for me, it was another massive education, and I loved learning the cultures, I loved traveling all over the world, and missed a, missed a couple continents, but had, uh, uh, today I don't necessarily want to travel much, because I have probably, I estimated probably five million miles in the air, oh. so, so I did have, travel a lot. Do you have a favorite travel spot? I know I didn't prepare um, you for this. <laughs> yeah, I like, I mean, there's two places, I think S Singapore, and Sydney, Australia, I think, are very unique and in a bunch of ways, politically good and bad, but also just very interesting um, uh, places to visit. Plus, Singapore is a city-state, and you know it, that makes it very unique because it's its own country and it's just a city. The rest of them kind of sort of spill down, you know, Paris and New York and London and. I have to say, you know, New York and San Francisco are still, now today, again, we get too close, but there's American cities that are very exciting. But I did a lot in China. I started a couple businesses, so um, spent a fair amount of time in Shanghai and Korea and, and Tokyo and so on. But, so I had a good perspective of different cultures and cities. So I had lots of favorite places, but for some reason I go back to Singapore and Sydney, two really neat places. And so going back to, you know, you've had these successful businesses, how did Purdue tee you up? I think, I think it was the whole idea of um, giving me a foundation of problem solving. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of things in life, there's, there's people, you think of this as mathematics, but you can take it to sort of a conceptual level in that, you know, algebra, for example, is, you know, solving a problem with an unknown. Well, that's, engineering's a little bit that way. It's creating a, a new idea or solving a problem with unknowns. And I think, you know, a Purdue engineering degree gives you that kind of platform that's very unique. Um, and, and even later on, as you, you know, from the marketing point of view, I think there's some carryover in this discussion of that, where, um, you know, engineering and marketing sound like they're a long way apart, but I don't. Another perspective of that would be um, engineering and um, marketing start both, both start with facts and, um, and data. And then to think of today's world, I'm talking back in 19, you know, 68 to 72. But still, data and facts is where everything starts in uh, the engineering education. And uh, from, from the facts, you do analysis. And from the analysis, you pull together and you have findings. And what you do with the findings is you collect the findings and you have a conclusion. Mm -hmm. And when you have a conclusion, then you can think about uh, a recommendation on what to do, but then ultimately you take that recommendation mindset and you make a decision, sometimes between one or two different ideas. So it goes facts, it goes uh, um, analysis, it goes um, conclusions, 
it, it goes to recommendations and it goes to a decision and a solution out in the real world. Well, what's interesting, you can line that up for engineering, it's very clear. I could line it up being an executive vice president of marketing at Kraft. It had the same thinking, very different characteristics, but still the same thinking in your brain, so to speak. So it's really fun to compare those. They're, they seem far apart, but from an education point of view, they can, that's the transition. How did I get from engineering to marketing? And there was a lot of circumstantial things and luck there, but that's right. correct. I had uh, craft marketing for about eight years, all craft marketing. That's super interesting. So, you know, you're here in, at this President's Council weekend. Um, a lot of people know who you are at Purdue, and, and you've been very generous in your donations. Why do you think it's important to give back to Purdue after all this time? Yeah, giving back right now, I'm 71 years old, and so giving back is kind of in that season of my life. Purdue's been there a few years earlier, um, but I have, um, I have a real focus today of, of giving back in general. And I, the, the underpinning of that is I try to touch as many people as I can. Um, I have Purdue, I have the University of Chicago, I have Mayo Clinic, and um, um, then I have uh, a hunger program and, uh, and I have Habitat for Humanity efforts that go on. So. Um, I started at Clay City, though. Um, I'm in the process of, we're in the final phases of a community center being built there and under my name of my mom and dad. So the gift thing is very much there. In the case of the gift of Purdue, it's just like, let's face it, I'm here today because Purdue is the foundation of where I started my education that led to the career we're talking about. And with your endowment with, with Coach Painter, it sounds like from a very early age you were excited about basketball. I was. <laughs> so, you know, tell us about that and why, why you chose to give back to the athletics program, specifically basketball. Athletics, this is another thing going back to uh, sort of my, my experience um, in more of a, um, a, a larger perspective. I could go to, to in major cities uh, around the world and they know about the football team and the basketball team, whether you're in Tokyo or Paris or London or, or Tel Aviv, wherever, you can, people are aware of that. But they're very much aware of the engineering program. Uh, but it's interesting to see how speckled even athletics leaks through. Now some of that's just because people know me and, and want to follow the Purdue sports, but it's, um, it's a very, um, ath athletics can actually be, in my word, back to touching as many people as possible. It can touch people in a global sense, uh, obviously a lot more focus back to the United States, but it can, um, um, it can, it can also uh, uh, take sort of the conventional thing of alums, and by the way, this is dynamic if you think about it. It impacts alums over time, it impacts students over time, and it impacts high school or junior high kids over time. So you get this mass of people that are, know more about the athletic department than the integrity of, of the engineering program or the pre-med or the vet school or on and on. So I looked at that in, in sort of a, maybe a convoluted way, but it's not only do I like the basketball athletic concept, but I think it's also very much of representing who Purdue University is. And it's, it's, it can be somebody from the third grade to, you know, somebody 95 years old and it's all relevant. So, uh, I do think that you, you mentioned one other thing was, um, um, I, you know, Matt plays a big important role in that whole setting. Um, I mean, he is a paramount symbol of who Purdue is. Again, back to this visualization when you look at athletics. I mean, here's a guy that's uh, second in the winning streak, so winning's important of, of Purdue, fifth in terms of the Big Ten. Um, and uh, secondly, you know, I know firsthand he works very hard on student athlete education. Mm -hmm. And not just the education piece, what are you going to do? What are the careers? It's sort of the Little League, you know, concept of how many kids are in Little League that will ever play Major League Baseball when there's fewer than 800 people, you know, playing Major League Baseball. Um, so he really works on that sincerely. And I think the last point is, uh, I, I, I think he's a model for all sports, co college sports, when it comes to what is ethical and the right thing to do. Sure. So that's why athletics, 
Um, that's um, why basketball, oh, I've got a little one for you on basketball. The last year for the 2021 NCAA, mm -hmm. because it was in Indiana, I thought it was a great phrase, so I'm, I'm plagiarizing. But it said, in 49 states, it's just basketball. But this is Indiana, so I think there's my basketball yeah. thing. Yeah, <laughs> um, and you're you're also really still involved with Purdue overall. You know, you come back to campus a lot. You're involved with all different departments. Yeah. What does it mean to you to to be part of this community? You know, after yeah. all this time. Well, I think it relates to the last things you were talking about. It's another way of giving back. You know, and I'm trying to give back because it's not for any recognition or compensation or anything. It's just whatever I've done. I've done a lot even with a couple Ivy League schools because I did so much in China that the textbooks will tell all the, the graduate students in, in business what to do, but it doesn't have people talking about that were on the ground that started up businesses. So, so that's a, a, an example of the idea that uh, you know, it's, it's giving back in that mode. I will say that the, the, re, the thing that I find really positive, um, I'll try to get some names for you, but um, I'm getting access to being back on campus. It's not me sort of, you know, running around. But Jay Ackridge is, has just been fabulous. What a great provost. And, uh, and obviously being the dean of the agricultural school, it's a he comes from a large base and, and, and a foundation here, I think. And he opened a lot of doors for me. He opened doors um, with um, Natalie uh, Duval Cotill and uh, in the innovation and entrepreneurship group. I'm actually doing a class March the 1st, so I do some, you know, presentation set slash lectures, so that, I did that. Uh, but he also, you know, plugged in uh, uh, Professor Hummels, and he and I kind of have, he's really into basketball, so we have a little bit of a connection on that. He's a University of Chicago graduate as well, but he got the PhD, I got the <laughs> MBA. And so uh, I have a lot of access from him, and I, I am working with one of his in, uh, people to be possibly doing lectures now in the MBA program, and it fits and I've done some work on the engineering MBA five-year program, new degree. So I'm doing that. And then um, uh, the, the Matt Falk, the CEO of Purdue for Life, has opened doors. And, um, and then the athletic department, both all the way going back to Morgan Burke and now Mike Babinski, um, you know, they make access for me. So, and or have me doing things, involvement. In, um, um, and that's, that's very rewarding. So my desire is giving, but the, you know, sort of the benefit is the things of, that are truly on the classroom um, and helping students and professors with whatever my experience can help with. When you look back and reflect on your time at Purdue, is there anything you would have done differently? No, I have a theme on that one. Uh, um, it's a little awkward, but I'm, I'm, I'm here today a little bit of faith in this one, okay? I'm here today because it is meant to be, okay? okay? And that means I don't regret or resent anything back in the future. You're talking about what would I change at Purdue or what do I regret? I, I don't because that's all part of the equation of why I'm here today. Right. And uh, there's peaks and valleys in everyone's life. And uh, I will say I'm very blessed, I'm very fortunate, but uh, I'm meant to be here today, and that's a com composite of a bunch of things that have happened uh, over time. And, um, and therefore, I don't dwell on the, the past. I try to focus on, you know, where I am today and, and where we go from here. Sure, and like every little step brought you to where you are that's today. That's right, that's right. What advice would you give to today's Purdue student? Well. If I look around and think of success, of people I've seen that are successful, um, there is one characteristic that's very simple, and it's, first of all, it's, they work hard. They really, really work hard. And what's interesting with that phrase, you know, that can be sort of a descriptive or prescriptive thing, but, but they have to, the people that are successful persist to work hard. And so it's working hard and persistence. Sounds elementary, but that's true in, in, your, in your college education. It's true in every job you're gonna do. I guess your family, your relationships, you know, you gotta work hard and you gotta keep at it. Um, the second one is something that I write in personal life, but I've used and everybody gets, my friends get tired of the, the corny reference, but we only manage the future. We don't manage the past. Sure. 
Sure. We can learn from the past, but to a, a young student, for them to get in perspective, hey, don't worry about even failures. You can learn from failures in the past. And if things aren't going right, it's in the past. You can't change it. But what you do control 100% is you can manage the future. You can't manage the past. That's sort of two things I would think about with students. Sure, that makes sense. Why are you proud to be a Boilermaker? What makes Purdue so unique in your eyes? Well, I think the word unique is exactly the appropriate word. It's, it's because it is unique. It's not just unique in my eyes. I think it's authentically unique. And um, um, when I think about today, I've done some research with the University of Chicago and looking at the economy and, and seeing how the economy since 1989 has really been, with a very few exceptions, has been on a phenomenal growth. But it's been built around technology. And so Purdue is a STEM institution the science, technology, engineering, and math, it is there. And, and technology is one of those four, but really they still blend together. And um, when, we th when we think about the uniqueness of Purdue, it's clearly, and it's good today, it's even more of a, of a billboard and a pronouncement today of uniqueness and value that, um, that it is an institution that's really grounded in that. And um, I think that's not wanting to be, you know, uh, uh, a superior, uh, excellent educational institution, but in fact has a framework to make that happen. So um, um, I, uh, I think the, the whole idea of technology driving the economy, the economy has been so, so strong since 1989, the consistency, and it's coming from technology, but it takes engineering and science and math and other things. I mean, there's other schools, obviously, in the Purdue uh, curriculum and, and, and degree choices, but specifically to the area that I'm familiar with, it's, I think it's a really, truly unique and superior institution, and the planning and the future need to continue to value that, because I use the term in different ways. I hope that leadership of the university is looking at the horizon, you know, not at the, the ground. And the horizons, you know, the where the earth and the sky meet, but it's as far as you can see is the more better phrase to think about. And um, I think we're in a very good position today. And now the question is how do we, you know, uh, perpetuate that into the future to be continuing to be unique and superior institution. And, and I also think that's with superior professors, uh, unique and superior students, and unique and superior outcomes, results. So that's kind of the way I think about that.